good afternoon. Welcome everyone. Thanks for coming, joining us this afternoon in the post-lunch lull. Uh, my name's Matt, I work for the Rennet Research Centre and for the Agroecology Project. Um, for those of you who don't know, Agroecology is a free knowledge hub sharing practical advice on agroecological farming practices. We've got a stand just there, so uh, yeah, come and see us. Um, today we're talking about living mulches, and this is part of a bigger piece of work we're doing to create sort of technical guides into individual practices. So over the next kind of six months, we're going to be creating a technical guide on living mulches, just to answer the questions that farmers have got if they're looking at new practices and they want to understand what do I need to do, how do I do it, why is this going wrong? Um, so this is a bit of that, and um, so this will be a quite, it's only a 25 minute session, so I will hurry up, um, and yeah, just keep an eye out on the Agroecology website for more information. Today I'm joined by another Matt, uh, a slightly more handsome one, and one who's got more hair. Uh, this is Matt England of the Fring Estate, he is the estate manager there. I'm going to share some research findings into living mulches that were done on farm over the last sort of four years and then Matt's going to talk about what he's doing on the Fring Estate with Living Mulches. So, just get this to work, there we go. So what are Living Mulches? Um, they're a semi-permanent ground cover uh, that you could direct drill cereals into, in essence. Um, the first recorded trials on them were done in the 40s in America, that's the oldest I found back. So as with most things in life, nothing is new. Um, there's loads of reasons why you might consider them or are interested in them, and the turnout here kind of shows there is good interest and has been for quite a few years. In, the perf in a perfect world, if you put all the papers together on living mulches, they are going to basically transform your farm. They're going to reduce runoff, suppress weeds, they're going to improve soil health, they're going to enhance insect populations, they're going to reduce costs, improve soil health, uh, I mean the list goes on, you know, and as you're all here today, trying to get all these things out of living mulches is nearly impossible, um, but there's ways to approach it, there's things to consider that can help you get more of these kind of, these positives out of, out of the system. The research I'm going to look at comes originally from an innovative farmer's lab that was a three-year project. It included AHDB, uh, Organic Arable, and the Organic Research Centre. So there's some research from there into, into sort of what the system was doing to the soil health and, and yields. And then last year, we were funded by the Elizabeth Gilmore Charitable Foundation, and we did more research into soil health and looked at beneficial insect populations. So the system that we used in these trials it was a white clover mix that was oversown into a spring wheat. It was 70% Aberace and 30% Aberherald. It's quite important that what you choose your living mulch to be um, in terms of vigour. And I think Matt will share a couple of stories where it was slightly over vigorous. Um, the Aber Aberace is a wild, low growing, small leaf clover. And the Aber Herald is a medium-sized clover, so that's also got quite a low-growing habit. That's really, really quite important, and that was sown at a rate of seven and a half kilos a hectare. Really, that's kind of the establishment phase. The true living mulch is in the second year. So after harvest, the winter oats, or sorry, after harvest, winter oats, wheat or rye, all three were done across the trials, a direct drilled into that living mulch and that mulch was then grazed in sort of January time. This, these trials are done on organic farms, so the, because of the weed burden, something we'll talk about in a bit, after that second year of the living mulch, you know, the, it was a herbal lay was stitched into the, the, the living mulch um, that was then used for grazing sheep. So a couple of considerations within this, and that goes to anyone if they're looking into the system. You know, the living mulch variety selection is really important. Depends on your soil type, depends on the varieties you're choosing. That cereal selection is critical, it massively affects yield. And then the variety of that cereal is also really important. We, you know, in some of the, the trials we saw modern wheat varieties getting pulled down by clover that's just too vigorous for it. Um, and then there's also the sort of generally the management of the living mulch as it grows to knock it back at the times that you, that you do that. So just going from, I think it's on your left, is it? 
Yeah, the left, the first table available nitrogen massively increased after two years of a living mulch, which you'd expect. You know, the clover is pretty nitrogen. The big issue that lots of people have is the yield penalty. So in that middle chart, it's, this is a crop of wheat, and there was a 30% yield penalty. So uh, for some people, you're like, it's just no way, we're not going to do that. You need to consider that in that year, cost of production was reduced by 20%, so you're reducing that. And if you weren't growing wheat, in last year's rye trial, the difference in yield, was the penalty was only 8% from the mulch to the control. So again, it just highlights the, the importance of variety selection and, and cereal selection. Wheat control is a massive thing that's touted for living mulches as a benefit. That sort of top chart shows that overall wheat prevalence is reduced massively through the use of living mulches. But what you see in the one underneath is that the percentage abundance of perennials jumps up above annuals. So on this particular farm, they had a massive charlock issue. That was almost knocked out, but thistles and docks, they really come into their own in, in that living mulch system. Again, it was an organic farm, so there are other control methods available if you're not organic, and that might mean you can run the living mulch system for a bit longer and not suffer from, from the, the perennial weeds. Soil structure, this is last year's results, soil structure across the, all the sample plots in the living mulch way, way higher, um, and that's kind of was found in the years before as well. Um, also, earthworm population and abundance massively in, improved in the living mulches. Slightly kind of unsurprisingly, in one, from one avenue, unsurprisingly, slope population is much, much higher in the living mulches. We did think that the carabid beetles would love the living mulches and they would then predate on the slugs and therefore reduce the slug numbers. But what we saw was lower carabid numbers and massively increased slugs. So this needs a bit more research because overall the insect diversity is much higher in living mulches. But the looking at last, you know, they're coming into this year, the farmer who had the 8% rye reduction yield penalty, sorry, he thought, rye is the answer, I'm going to do it with rye, that will solve all of my problems. The high slug populations, the slugs love the rye, and they knocked out 80% of the crop before we even got to late May. So again, this is, this is sort of what we're coming to, is the farmer insights to mix with the research. As a single line practice, as an individual practice on a farm, it's got a lot of faults, there's a lot of issues with it. But if you're looking at it whole systems approach, if you're using it to extend your rotation, if you're using it to build more resilience into your system, it's a really useful tool. I love them, I think they're one of the best things, but I am deeply aware of the flaws that exist across the system. So the quality of the herbal lay, uh, Mark Lee, whose farm a lot of the trials are done on, says the herbal lay that he stitches in and fattens his sheep on is absolutely glorious. He fattens his sheep up better than anything he's ever, ever used before. Um, it is the whole thing is season specific, crop specific, site specific, you know, as a lot of things are. And your farm, one system may work for you, for your neighbour, it's not going to work, so it's a bit of trial and error. There is significant cost reduction within it because of the, the lack of using tractors for, for other things, uh, to, sorry, to get onto the land. Um, and the, one of the big things that Mark pointed out was that this higher seeding rate is needed within the living mulch. This is due to the low, lower tillering that's happening in the cereal crops under the mulch. Last little thing before I hand over to Matt is that the big challenges as you look at the system, if you think about implementing it, establishment is a major issue if you have a very dry spring. If you're trying to establish that clover in sort of May time, April time, it's very dry. If it doesn't establish, when you go into the proper living mulch year, you're going to be very patchy, you're going to suffer from a lot of weed burden and you're not going to get the benefits that the whole system really should be, should be bringing in. Um, the management of the clover is really significant. I mentioned earlier that you can end up with wheat crops being pulled down by the vigorousness of the clover. Um, and again, the cash crop variety selection can affect that quite significantly. Just the last point to go back again, perennial weed management is really big. If you're organic, really you can't run this system beyond one year of true living mulch. But if you're conventional, then there's other options available to you. That's it from me. I will hand over to Matt.
Um, yes, so I farm on the Fring Estate in northwest Norfolk. Um, so we, part of the farm is tenanted from the Sandringham Estate, and that part of the farm is farmed organically. Now this is the, the area of the farm that we're trying the living mulch trial on, um, and this is quite difficult because it's very light, sandy soil and pretty low fertility, so it's been a bit of a challenge this year to get the, get the living mulch working, but it seems to have done. Um, so within our rotation we're growing cereals, linseed, peas and we also have pigs and cattle grazing on lays as part of that as well. So why living mulches? Uh, so Matt's run through quite a few of these points already but I guess the main, the key point for me really is that I want to harvest the sun's energy in July, August and September when the solar radiation is at its highest and typically most farms, including ourselves, have absolutely nothing growing on the ground at that time of year. So I think it's key to make the most of that sun while it's there in the summer. And then a number of the other, other points here, Matt's already talked about, um, so I'll just skip over those. Um, so I'll run you, run you through our experiences on, on the Fring Estate uh, with living mulches and how we've got on. Um, so to start with, the first year uh, we had some established red clover, which I thought would be a good idea to try and establish some cereals into. We, what we did with it, we, we, harvest, we uh, took, a, took a cut of silage off it in the autumn and then in the spring we intended on sowing spring barley around March time. Now I tried this in three different ways. I ploughed and drilled it, which was sort of the farm standard. I then mint tilled and drilled it to try and knock the clover back a little bit. And then we tried direct drilling it straight into that clover sward. Now obviously the plough and drill, the farm standard, was a success. Um, but the min till and the direct drill were a complete failure. Um, I think this is probably for two reasons. Firstly, trying to sow a crop in, um, in March doesn't really give it enough, enough chance to get away from the clover, especially when we were dealing with red clover, which is very aggressive and, and definitely not a species I'd use again in a living mulch. I thought it was worth mentioning that in this year I was also trying intercropping out. Um, and this gave me some really interesting insights into what growing two, two species in the same field could give you as a benefit to your crop. Um, so we were trying uh, peas and barley and also beans and oats um, in the rotation. And straight away I was seeing some real benefits. You see the picture on the left there um, was a, a crop of oats um, where it's looking really healthy versus a monocrop of oats um, where the oats really weren't looking quite so good. So definitely some real benefits just to general plant health uh, by having it growing with a legume. I was then also seeing some real benefits uh, for weed control where I had a bicrop in place. Uh, the picture on the right there shows um, a bicrop of beans and oats on the left and then a crop of beans on their own which are absolutely choked out uh, with fat hen and thistles. So straight away you're seeing some real benefits um, just controlling the weeds of having those oats growing with the legume. On top of that, throughout this period I was seeing um, how having clover within the rotation, especially when you can have it there for an extra year, um, really improves the, the following crop. Um, so you see from this green area index map there, um, that that area there, we left, it, we left two and a half hectares for another year, and you could really see the benefit to the following crop. The picture on the left is taken from inside that darker area, whereas the picture on the right is taken from the rest of the field. So definitely, I, I mean, it goes without saying really the clover increases fertility, but I wanted to find a way of bringing this within our rotation, and living mulches seem to be the answer. So with that, last spring, in, around April, um, I established Jura White Clover, which was under into a spring barley crop in April. Um, now luckily it was a really wet harvest, um, so the, the clover really grew away quite nicely, so by the time it came to harvest, we had a really nice green, green map right the way across the field. And once the, once the crop was off, it really sort of exploded into life. Now straight away, um, in that living mulch, I was seeing some benefits quite quickly. Um, so versus bare, a bare stubble on the left there, um, doing a worm count in September, I was finding pretty much no worms in there at all. Whereas in the living mulch, at that same time, I was finding 10 worms plus. So instantly seeing how the clover is really feeding that life in the soil. So now we had this, this nice clover sward established, it was really trying to work out how you, how you get a crop going. So this is what the, uh, the field looked like on the left there. 
And then we, um, in, August, in October and November time, we then got some sheep onto the field and grazed it really, really tightly, almost to the point where you could see sort of bare soil on the ground. The next step was then, uh, then to sow some Muscani winter oats. Um, so I sowed them on the 10th of November, uh, 400 plants per square metre. That was around 20% higher than the farm average uh, when we were sowing um, just into plough work. And you can see from this picture here, the clover had started to go in dormancy, and about three weeks later, it was a nice mild December, the oats really started to grow away quite, quite well as the, as the clover was going dormant. As part of this demonstration, I also um, had a control where I just ploughed in the clover and established oats, and I also tried a, a mint till just to see how those two compared with the living mulch trial. So after, after what was a very mild winter, um, on the 13th of February, this is how the oats looked, which is kind of just how we wanted them to look. Um, they had grown away really well, got established. The clover was still sitting there, not really growing, still in dormancy. Um, and around this time, I also managed to get around 20 cubic metres of digestate onto the field, just to try and give the oats a bit of a push uh, to get them going. Now, by the end of March, uh, the clover really sort of kicked into life, as you'd expect it to. Um, but luckily the oats were growing very well too, so both of them sort of came up together and this is again how I really wanted it to look at this time of year um, with both of them growing well, the clover covering all the ground there, so keeping all the annual weeds down, um, which is key in our, in our organic rotation. So by, uh, sorry, in, in March then I also, at that same time, I did another uh, soil test, a worm count even, and again, looking at the plough versus the living mulch, I was only finding around one or two worms in the plough work, um, whereas if you go to the living mulch field, I was finding sort of 15 to 20. So definitely another real obvious indicator that the living mulch is doing some real good for the soil. Um, and then similarly, to, um, to the bi-crop, I was seeing how the oats just looked a bit healthier in the living mulch versus your normal ploughed field. So again, something going on there with the two, the two working quite well together. So how does, uh, how does the clover look now? So this is, this is how it's looking at the minute. Um, it, was, it was quite touch and go right the way through spring. They looked very, very even. They were sort of competing with each other quite heavily. Um, but luckily, as the panicle started to emerge, the clover really did start to take over. They, sorry, the, the oats really started to take over. And the, oats, the clover was just sitting in the bottom of the oats there. So it looked really good. The clover was doing what we wanted it to. If you look at the roots there, there's some nice nodules on there, it's fixing nitrogen in the soil. Um, it was sitting in the bottom of those, those oats. Um, the only downside I was seeing on areas of, of the field where the fertility was particularly low, and we do get quite a lot of variation in our organic system, especially with pigs, um, on those low fertility areas, the tiller numbers did seem to be quite significantly down. Um, so that's just something to, to consider, consider going forward. However, in the field where we had really high food fertility, especially on areas where the pigs have put down quite a lot of nutrition a couple of years before, this is where the living mulch really does seem to have work, worked. There was plenty of nutrition there to, to really get the oats growing, so they did shade out the clover, they tillered out nicely. Um, there's a Labrador in that picture for scale somewhere, just to show how tall they did get, but no, they were looking really good. So what does that mean for yield? Well, I've, only, I've sort of done some tiller counts to try and get an idea what, what yield I can expect this year. Um, and looking at the tillers, we are around, uh, in, the, in the living mulch, we've got around 228 tillers, um, whereas in the control, there was around 324, so quite significantly down on tillers. Um, so it's looking like there may be up to a 20% yield penalty, penalty um, from the living mulch versus the control. However, it is worth mentioning that the, the actual panicles, look, the, the plants look a lot healthier, so there seems to be more seeds per panicle um, in the living mulch field than in the, in the control, so that might help bring yield up a bit um, also. It's also worth mentioning that there is a 20% yield loss here, but actually in, in an organic system, we are building fertility in the rotation, which is kind of key when the control there, is, all that's doing is depleting it. And it's a second cereal, so it's never going to do particularly well after that. Whereas I could pretty much guarantee after the living mulch trial, I'd get a pretty good crop afterwards. Added to which, we've managed to get a crop established in a way 
um, without any, any major weed problems and without having to till the soil, which is something I haven't really done before organically. So the key lessons I'll give to you to take away if you're going to try it at home, um, I'd say that spring crops definitely don't work. There's not a lot of time for them to get established and get away from the clover. Um, and then if you are going to try autumn crops, I think it's key to sow once the clover has gone into dormancy, or at least is going into dormancy, sort of just before it goes into dormancy. Um, and then if you can, knock it back with sheep or something. Um, that will give you, give you oats or whatever cereal you're growing a much better chance to get away. Um, and then finally, the living mulch does seem to have been a success in these areas of the field where I've got lots of fertility. So maybe in a conventional system, or perhaps if I, if I fed the crop a bit more, um, I might have got, got different results. So that's pretty much all I've got to say. Any, any questions at all? really impressed with your commitment to a solid research trial there with a, with a control and some other other things so that's brilliant work mate um, and long may it continue so we just want to open up the floor to any questions if you've got we've got one at the back right up there please thank you could you talk a bit more about whether it would work this year will you, will you keep using that living, living mulch in an organic system and the first speaker you said it wouldn't work because the build-up of weeds but that's obviously the holy grail for organic where we have we end up using the plough which uh, makes us very unpopular at places like Groundsville. Um, yeah so I think I'm looking at Mark Lee's system he's up in Shropshire um, that second year of living mulch the increase in perennial weeds particularly on his farm you know his sandy loam he's got outrageous levels of thistles and outrageous levels of docks which means he just has to he has to plow you know when he puts it into into a fertility building lane then he, he goes back to plowing to control those weeds he would rather not he'd love to do more and i know of some conventional farmers who are running that living mulch for two or three years in its full full state but i haven't seen any organic farmers who have had to terminate i don't know what you're going to do on that matt i think with that field we probably will try it for another year we do have a few thistles coming in, but no more than in the in the sort of farm standard where we ploughed it. Um, so I think it'd be it'd be a shame not to then try and, and have another go and see if we can get another cereal established. Whether I try rye or, or winter oats, we haven't quite decided yet. But yeah, I think the looking at Mark's situation is that if he has poor establishment and you've got patchy germination, you're on the back foot. So it may be that you have a, if you had fantastic germination and coverage that that perennial weed issue is going to remain lower so you might get away with it for a couple of years um, you'll have to come back next year to hear what Matt says about how that works yeah. any other questions down here just making you walk all the way across and then we're going to go in the middle after that Hi Matt, I'm a very uh, novice organic farmer and I've got a living mulch which has um, uh, established well and I've got the first wheat that is looking quite good at this stage. What would you do, because I want to follow it on with another cereal, would you have to follow that, do I have to follow that with wheat or, or would I be able to follow it with oats do you think if I, if I planted it late and let sheep graze uh, well into the autumn, the uh, wheat stubble? I think any, any cereal, if you can guarantee it can get away and get ahead of the living mulch, I think that's key. It needs to be competitive and be able to, in the spring, come out the blocks and really start to shade out the clover. I think that's the issue we've had in a few places where, where it doesn't shade out the clover is when the clover starts to take over a bit and that's where you start to lose those tiller numbers um, in the field, I think. So, yeah, I mean, I, I'm going to try, I think I might try winter rye because I know it's going to be competitive out the blocks, but I'm sure you could probably have another go with with wheat again or, or winter oats. Okay, we've got two more questions. We'll just go quickly on the right behind this chap and then we'll jump to our man in the middle. Hi, thank you. That was really interesting. Um, I've got a living mulch in situ at the moment which is looking a lot less good than yours. Uh, I've got a couple of questions. One is what drill you used and the second one is was there any mechanical weeding or sort of management of the clover post sheep grazing? Um, so we've got a horse pronto, which isn't, isn't a direct drill, but luckily we're on quite light, sandy soil. 
Um, so if, if I do, if I drill into it with the pronto and roll afterwards, it does sort of seal the slot and it, and it seems to work. So I mean, potentially we could have got better establishment if we did have a, a proper direct drill. Um, and then the other question, sorry, what was the other question? Any mechanical weeding of any sort? Um, I, I tried, I was harrowing the field next door, just in, in, a, in a plough field next door, and I thought I'd run over the clover and see if that did anything, but no matter how aggressive I went with the harrows, it didn't really touch the clover at all. I left a couple of strips I didn't touch, and you wouldn't, you wouldn't have spotted it. My last question in the middle. Yeah. Hi, yeah. I'm a, a biocomplete compost maker. Um, and I'm fascinated that uh, that's another type of living mulch, isn't it? The maximum biology compost. And sort of uh, had this, basically I don't know why sort of seed composts don't exist to sort of complete the, the, you know, the regenerative soil cycle. You get the biology back and then you get the plant roots in one application. I'm just wondering if you guys had any experience, had any thought about applying cover crops with biology extracts or compost uh, and, and whether or not you can imagine that helping or being viable, it's possibly just not economically viable because of the way farming happens, but I'd just be really interested if you had any experience with that. I have one experience with it, but there's a chap speaking tomorrow afternoon at 3.15 in here, Tom Knowles, and he applies Johnson Sioux based compost teas. Into, onto his animal crops and he is using a wild farm system so there's going to be some form of bio crop or undersowing in there so it might be worth to have a chat with him. Um, so I don't know if you've had any use of it. Not really, I'd say the, the more fertility you can get into an organic rotation the better so if you're putting on compost and then seeds afterwards that all sounds sound great really. So, yeah. We're going to have to leave it there folks, we've overrun. Thank you for your time, if you need more information then we'll see you over there.